I wanted to dedicate an entire video to the frontman. To me, he is the most mysterious person in this show, and his super rad mask definitely adds to his enigma. So let's take a deep dive into who the frontman is, and predict where he may go in later seasons, if we get more seasons. But judging by the fact that Squid Game is still number one on Netflix, IMDb, and everyone in their turtle has heard of this show's existence, there will most likely be a season two. So let's do some talking about the frontman. Oh, by the way, spoilers, obviously. The frontman operates and oversees all matters at the facility. He carries out the orders of the host, makes sure all the games run smoothly, and ensures that the VIPs have a good time while watching the games, which truly, um, truly looks like the most uncomfortable job to fulfill on the island. All of the records of the previous Squid Game participants appeared to be from South Korea. The only reason I say this is because during Season 1, Episode 7, VIPs, the third VIP makes a quick comment claiming that the contest in Korea was the best, most likely implying that the contest in South Korea is one of many happening all around the world, possibly making Number One's company an international business. These other competitions would be owned by Number One, but each country's games would be independently run by their own frontman. So the frontman may not be the only frontman in their world. So how did our frontman become the second in command of this facility? And the leader of all the guards went on his way to his brother's apartment. Huang Jinho is on the phone with his mother and claims that his brother is always dodging his calls. The frontman hadn't been missing for too long during this conversation, as Jin Ho was about to start contacting everyone who may know his whereabouts, and if he couldn't find anything, he was going to report his brother missing the next day. The frontman's landlord claimed that she checked in on him every day since the unpaid rent was due, which was one week prior to her and Jin Ho's conversation. The fish in the frontman's apartment were the opposite of alive, so he has definitely been gone for at least a week. Jin Ho discovers that his brother had held on to a Squid Game card from a previous competition back in 2015, storing it inside a box that looks like one of the coffins on the island, causing Jin Ho to put two and two together, and safely assume that his brother went to play in Squid Game 2020. The games happen only once a year, so it's very possible that after the frontman won back in 2015, he went back and forth between his normal life and managing the games. He could still somewhat maintain his social life life during the year, but the games already must have been so time consuming that he's always ignoring his family. Huang Jin Ho did a thing. He snuck onto the island, killed a guard named Number 29, took his outfit, and pretended to be him, causing him to get roped into an organ harvesting side hustle with the other guards at the facility. You know, classic Thursday night activities with the boys. During Jin Ho's encounter with these guards, one of the triangles talks about a dying player who apparently shot up like a zombie and had one of its eyes popping out. This player was a woman who was shot with a sniper round during the red light green light game we saw in the first episode. The organ harvesters claimed that they sold the player's organs, but she only had one kidney. But when initially telling the story, the guards didn't specify the gender, so Jin Ho mistakenly thought the woman was his brother. Jin Ho reveals to number 28 and to us as an audience that his own brother, aka the frontman, gave him one of his kidneys. Something I noticed when re-watching episode 5 is that the list of players for Squid Game 1999 is like a book long, but for the 2020 games, the list of players is like an entire shelf, meaning that the number of players is growing every year. When reading through the list of winners, you can see that the games began in the year 1988. I know Oilam started the games out of boredom, but the reason it could have started specifically in 1988 is because Black Monday happened in October of 87, which is one of the most historical stock market crashes for the global economy. The stocks continued to suffer until January of 1988. This is a graph of what Dow Jones looked like during this time. Look at that dip. With the economy getting worse, more people are participating in the games every year. Sungi Hun is the latest participant and the latest winner in Squid Game. But back in 2015, 132, aka the frontman, was the winner. When taking a good long look at the frontman's player profile, you can see that he used to serve as a police officer, explaining how he 
we knew that the bullet that came out of 28's head was from a Smith & Wesson M60 revolver that was standard issue for Korean police. So the frontman and his brother were both police officers at one point. If we take a second look at the frontman's profile, way down at the bottom of the page, you can see that he was involved with bribery. This is what most likely caused him to get into money trouble as it got him fired from being a police officer, giving him a reason to enter the games. In just five years, the frontman went from a player to running the show. So what made him come back to the games? I mean, what made Sung Hun go back to the games? Sung Hun turned down seeing what's left of his family to return to the games to potentially take it down, but the main reason is still unknown. Who's to say at some point Sung Hun may be tempted to fall down the same path as the frontman? Sung Hun has a more optimistic view on humanity, but obviously has temptations to not be a good person. Plus, a lot of people were asking the question, if the frontman won the games back in 2015, how come he was still living in a very cheap small apartment? In the frontman's apartment, you can see Theory of Desire by Jacques Lecon. In Lecon's understanding of desire, he determines the distinction between wants and needs. He views the term desire as always wanting something more, as it is impossible to desire what you already possess, causing the object of desire to be constantly out of reach. Sung Hun also won the games, but didn't really spend any of the money as well, meaning both Sung Hun and the frontman found no satisfaction from the money they won. I do think the games are pretty unethical before and during Red Light Green Light, but I do think the rules are pretty fair after the first game, as the players are then aware of the situation and are then given a choice to continue playing or to leave and go home. But it's repeatedly shown to us that life on the outside is as bad, if not worse, than in the games, which is why the games have such a high return rate. The only time we see the frontman not execute a rule breaker immediately is when a participant and some guards are ruining the equal opportunity of the games, as he reminds them of the certain principles that make up Squid Game. We can tell from this interaction alone that the frontman believes in the games, his reasoning being that the players suffered from inequality and discrimination in the real world, but in the games, everyone is given an equal opportunity, claiming that the competition is offering each player one last chance to have a fair fight and win. 93% of players return after knowing they will probably die in the games. This fact alone supports the frontman's reasoning for continuing the games. More people return to it every year because they are left with no other option on the outside. But the frontman appears to be conflicted. When watching all of the games, he's behind a mask, so you can't really tell if he's enjoying it or not. When Huang Jinho is in the frontman's apartment, you can quickly see a book about Rene Magritte, the surrealist artist who is well known for his paintings The Son of Man and The Man in the Bowler Hat. In both these paintings, the view of the subject's face is obstructed. When looking at the painting The Son of Man, there's an apple blocking the view of the man's face. When discussing his painting, Magritte claimed that we always want to see what is hidden by what we see. The painting is a conflict between the visible that is hidden and the visible that is present. This is the central theme of the story, as the characters are constantly trying to figure out who each other are behind the masks. So with that in mind, I want to build a case that the frontman is having doubts about the games. And the best way to prove this theory is to analyze the relationship between the frontman and his brother. When looking for the intruder on the island, the frontman is called over to examine a body that washed up on shore. He's handed Jin Ho's police ID that was recovered from said body. The frontman could clearly tell that the body was not the intruder, because even though the face of the body was pretty torn up, it still looked nothing like his brother. Explaining why the frontman still had people looking for the intruder later in the episode. The frontman and Huang Jin Ho have a lot of parallels. They are brothers who were both police officers at one point. They both have one kidney on opposite sides of their bodies, and during the confrontation on the cliff, the brothers exchange bullets in opposite shoulders. It's basically light side versus dark side. It's essentially Darth Vader versus Obi-Wan Kenobi. The frontman being the Darth Vader as he's someone who's turned to the dark side, but a part of him is still desperately wanting to be good. And Huang Jin Ho being the Obi-Wan Kenobi as he's incorruptible and can't be brought over to the dark. It's very possible that Jin Ho could still be alive. If the frontman can survive a bullet to the shoulder, it's more than reasonable to assume that Jin Ho could survive it as well, assuming the drop off the cliff is also survivable. Plus, we just see Jin Ho fall into the water. And if we're going by the show's logic, if we don't see a character die on screen, there's a good chance they're probably still alive. However, it's constantly shown to us throughout the series that 
that all dead bodies are incinerated. So it would go completely against the logic of the organization and the logic of the show to have the front man just leave Jin Ho's body in the ocean. Because if he did leave Jin Ho's body in the ocean, that would be Jin Ho's only way of escaping the island. The only thing that would explain Jin Ho still being alive would be that the front man couldn't finish the job. We already saw how emotional he was during this confrontation on the cliff. His hand was trembling as he was holding the gun, so it could be possible that the front man is keeping Jin Ho alive at the facility. The Squid Games are merciless. Anyone who breaks the rules dies. Anyone who reveals their identity dies. Basically a lot of strict rules with severe consequences. The front man who oversees all operations at the facility has to enforce these rules with no hesitation. But it seems he is struggling with the life he has chosen, especially when he is given a reminder of his life in the real world. It could be possible that the mirror scene where he sees a projection of his brother is not about his brother's death haunting him, but about the front man looking at the antithesis of what he's become. We saw that the front man's hand was trembling before before he shot his brother. This is because he was clearly emotional about taking his brother's life. However, the front man's hand is constantly trembling when he's holding the handgun throughout the season. If we quickly go back to episode 2, there's something related to the point that I'm trying to make here. Right here, when Jin Ho is in the front man's apartment, you can see a painting from Rene Magritte's Empire of Light series, which is a series of around 20 paintings that show nighttime urban streets below and a bright sunny daytime sky above. In his apartment, you can see two copies of this particular painting from the series. The landscape showing us night and the sky showing us day evokes the duality of light and dark. I feel like this image was intentionally used to hint at the internal battle of light and dark within the front man. It's possible that the main way to destroy the games would be the front man going back to the light in a sense and turning on the organization. With the host of the games now dead, it's implied that the front man will take over Oilam's position as the host, and will possibly be looking for a new frontman. That was my quick guide to the frontman. Obviously, I will be making more videos on the frontman when I figure out some more information about him, and if you want to keep seeing more Squid Game videos just like this one, please help support this channel by liking, subscribing, commenting, and doing all that stuff. And if you have any questions about Squid Game, or any theories you want me to debunk, or theories you want me to talk about, leave a comment down below, and I may talk about them in an upcoming video. As always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next Squid Game video. Mm -hmm.